This episode of the Cosmic Christian Podcast is brought to you by you. To support the podcast, please visit the links in the description. Okay, we all good then? I think we're golden. You sure? Kind of looks a little bit shit on that, but... Well, that's probably, probably your fault. I mean, this is. is this is your place. You ready now? No more fussing? Sure. This is a big, this is a big day. Go for it. This is a big day. Well, I know, I know. Big, I know big bit of news. This is going to explode. Okay. I, explode. I, I just can't wait for it. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm excited. And hopefully by the end of it, yeah. you, uh, you might join the team. Us, we see, like, miracles do happen, according to Christians. So, according, to, yeah. according to our our side of the fence. Welcome yeah. back, yeah, everybody, to... <laughs> welcome back, what am I talking about? Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Cosmic Christian Podcast, uh, a podcast dedicated to philosophical inquiry and the spreading of the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, unfortunately, because this is quite a new development, I haven't quite managed to get a graphic designer to make a logo for me, and even though Steve... You should know design, graphic, yeah. Um... I don't think he's particularly supportive of this move. So, no. I've got something a bit makeshift that I've just made. I hope you don't mind if I just no, no, you, you put that up. You go ahead, man. I'm I'm entirely endorsing your transition here. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very excited about this. Yeah, um, good so, for you. Good yeah, for you. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there we go. That'll do. Can everyone mm-hmm. see that? Good. Branding's the most important thing when it comes to this kind of stuff. Extremely important. Content always comes second for me. Yeah. Um, good. So yeah, for those who don't know, which is everybody except Steve, I recently converted to the good faith of Christianity. Um, I realized that God exists, and I thought, hey, why not make another podcast? Well, hopefully by the end of it, just like our last po- uh, podcast together, I can put a thumbnail saying, we agree now, and you'll... Uh, yeah, hopefully you can convert me, which will be, wow, it'll be good stuff. Mm-hmm. So first of all, congratulations. Thanks. I mean, are you happy that you're going to heaven? Because oh, like, that's... Uh, man, that's the best part about all of this. Yeah, like, because that's like really... That's that's that sells it, doesn't it? Mm. Like I really want that, but you know, yeah. Just, but I'm going to hell, and you're going to heaven. But so we can't chill out like we planned in hell. So no, it's, no, it's all okay. Yeah, fair enough. It's going to be a bit of a shame. Now, uh, my first question actually is just how are you going to deal with the new exposure? Like you are Christianity's new favorite toy. Like you've I've seen it in the comments. Like people are saying he's a real smart atheist. He's probably going to outgrow the atheist phase, as they mm. put it. Um, because they say, oh, I went through an atheist phase when I was, you know, a cool kid, but now I've realised there is a God. And it seems like you went through that transition and now you've come out the other way. You're going to get invites to, you know, capturing Christianity and Justin mm. Briley. Like, are you, are you prepared for just how much this is going to change your life? Yeah, you know, I was sat reflecting yeah. um, in my bed, lonesome at night, and I thought to myself, what are the benefits of Christianity versus atheism, the only two options on the table, obviously. Mm. And I thought, gosh, well, they were more or less equal. And then I took a kind of Pascalian wager on the fact that if I were to convert to Christianity, the ad revenue alone that I would get from videos discussing my conversion would probably make it all worth it. So It would, yeah. I remember this being expressed in terms of Matt Delahunty. If Matt converted, then, you know, it would have been big news. Mm. But, um, well, he just, he stayed in the atheist phase, whereas you... I've I've outgrown it. Does it feel something like being born again, considering that you was Christian before? Yeah, it's like being born again again. Oh, that's, that's it's quite great. It's quite good fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. So I just want to be crystal clear on this. Um, this has nothing to do with it being April 1st, does it? Like, I mean, call me sceptical, but like, that's, maybe I'm cynical, that's the way I'm looking at it, but it's got nothing to do with that. A- April, I is it really April 1st? It, it actually I, is. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't even you did, know okay, that's, okay, that's, that's a strange yeah. coincidence, isn't it? Well, yeah, and coincidences, like... Yeah. But fair enough. No, but it, as, it's not. as uh, my newfound faith teaches me, sometimes what appear to be coincidences can actually be miraculous. And I like to think that yeah, you know, yeah, what's yeah. happened to me recently has been miraculous. So I thought it would be fun to uh, to do a podcast with you, Steve. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to the conversion. And try to convince you to, uh, of, of theism, of Christianity, and, and, yeah. and see how far we get, given that um, 
I've now come to the truth and seen well, the light on this fine day of April 1st. Yeah, no, I, t I totally understand. Well, I mean, what's great is that you've been through the academy. You've had exposure mm. to these wonderful theists, um, these wonderful lecturers. I imagine most of your lecturers are, th are theists if they're in, the, in that faculty, or is that not the case? Uh, my theology tutor um, yeah. was an atheist, cool. the wonderful Dr. Even, even, yeah. Catherine Southwood, mm. a biblical scholar who actually gets quite annoyed when people presume that <sighs> if you're studying theology... Yeah you're going to be religious. I nearly mentioned that in my uh, interview, mm. and she told me later that if I'd have done that, it would have really rubbed her up the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, alas, yes, I think a good place to start, Steve, is to run through some of the traditional arguments for God's existence yes, uh, and see what you make of them, because I know you've engaged with them before, but, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we've got a bit of history, man. Well, well, well there's, there's two things. Like, first of all, with you going through the academy and mm. me just being this YouTuber, right, uh, frankly, this is a terrifying experience for me. I'd, I would sooner be in front of, you know, many apologists. Like, put Frank Turek in front of me, I'd have a better time. But this is this is intimidating stuff. But, hey, if truth is the ultimate goal, then, right, let's have at it. Like, worst case scenario, I'm going to have to go home and go, you know what, that's good. I, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, it's also possible that by the end of this podcast, yeah. I've, I've deconverted back into atheism. Oh, um, I'd love that. Cause I'd like, really like yeah. that to happen mainly because it means I wouldn't have to change all my branding and whatnot. So uh, if we can, we can get there, that would be that yeah. would be pretty fantastic. Well, I'll do my best. Okay, best. so why don't we begin, Steve, mm. with... Yeah, where you got? The oh. ontological oh, yeah, argument, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, okay. which I just I just stole from a, from a pile over there. Yes, and, and I hope you don't still mind. some. No, it's good. The ontological argument um, is a good place to start, I think, mm. because it, of course, demonstrates the tautological truth of God's existence. I think the, the ontological argument can be surmised as saying that God exists is essentially a tautology. It just it just means, uh, God means essentially the same thing as existence. So mm. why don't we take it back to Anselm? Anselm is a good place to Saint start. Saint Anselm of Canterbury, who right. wrote in the Proslogion that even the fool, even the fool, and that includes you, Steve. He is me. Even the fool, the, the atheist fool of the Psalms, um, who says in his heart that there is no God, even the fool can recognize or can conceive of a maximally uh, or a greatest conceivable being. Mm -hmm. By definition, it is possible to conceive of a greatest conceivable being, right? So you think Aquinas is wrong then? Because when Aquinas says that you can't actually conceive of God, you just he's, he's wrong. Yes, well, look, I'm not asking you to conceive of God. Steve, oh. who mentioned God? I don't remember. Oh, mentioning. it's not God. It's not. I don't okay. remember okay. mentioning God. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe maybe you heard me say I. I don't remember mentioning God. Yeah. All I'm asking you to do is imagine the greatest conceivable being. Mm -hmm. Now, Aquinas is 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 fine if he wants to say that you can't conceive of God. Um, this is something that that Descartes, I think, actually had a good line on when he was talking about uh, shapes. He he said, look, there's a difference between conceiving of something and grasping something, and I can't remember which way around he used. I think them, that was, I think that was Guanalo. Um, well, I, maybe he talks about it too, mm. but there's this, there's this distinction, this idea between if, if I asked you about a, like a 1000 sided shape or a 1012 mm. sided shape, you, you understand what that means. You can, you can, you can conceive of the, yeah. such a shape, but it doesn't mean you can kind of grasp. It doesn't mean you can picture it in your head. It doesn't mean mm. you can really like understand it and see it, but you can still know what it means and, uh, know enough about its nature to be able to actually do calculations and things with it. And when I'm yeah. asking you to conceive of a maximally conceivable being, I'm just asking you to conceive of it in that sense. And and if you think that there's some limitation on what you can conceive, then that's just the maximally conceivable being, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So just imagine, if you will, yeah. humor me, the greatest conceivable being. You doing it? <sighs> I've got Sagan in my head. <laughs> okay, Sagan. Well, I think we can improve upon Carl Sagan a little that's bit. Blast, firstly, that's blasphemy. Firstly, we make him Christian. <laughs> yes, true. Secondly, we make him all-powerful. Mm. Uh, thirdly, we make him all-loving and omniscient, um, and then we've essentially reached God. So, you know, I don't know if you want to go down that route. Well, I actually want to go back to where you're emphasizing on understanding mm. versus actually having the concept. Okay. So, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I think Daniel Bonavec and some others have spoken about it being in the context of Guanalo, mm -hmm. but it's not, and I appreciate that I'm not pronouncing Guanalo in the way that many philosophers do, which is just something I do. I'm going to mm. mispronounce names. Like, it's the YouTube career, what can I say? Not access to people that know how these things are pronounced. Ah. But it's, it's not his most famous um, response. His most famous response, of course, is the perfect island, which we can get to in a moment. Oh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. So you've got understanding of a concept, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you actually conceive of it. Okay. So another example would be, because you've given some, another example would be a square circle. Yeah. It's like, I understand that concept, but I don't actually conceive it. 
Another concept would be that it's raining just outside, mm-hmm. but it's also not raining outside. I understand that. The words make sense to me, but it's wrong to assume that therefore I have actually conceived it. And I'm wondering, how do you know that the maximally great being is not one of these square circles? But do they? Do they actually make sense to you? So you say you can understand a square circle. Mm. So if you understand what a square circle is, what is it? How many sides does it have? For well, th- this is what I mean. Like, I can understand the words. You can and then, and the now words I think I've got the concept, circle. right? So I think I've got the concept. Uh-huh. But on analysis, it might be revealed that I don't. Okay. Luckily, where it's such a, an example that's tangible, we can kind of assess it and realise this. Yeah. When it comes to like raining and not raining, like I'm using examples that are simple to try and communicate the point. Yes. But how do we know that the greatest conceivable being actually is something that we can conceive of? Because we can understand the words. I'm I'm kind of I'm Mm. kind of putting it definitionally to you that the greatest conceivable being is just whatever being it is that you are capable of conceiving of. Right. Mm -hmm. So if there's something that um, you think you can conceive of but can't, we can we can work with that for now. And then Mm -hmm. if it transpires that we actually don't conceive of that, we'll just you know lower the lower the boundary a little bit but i would say for myself that if you say a square circle i know what you mean in terms of what you're getting at you're Mm. getting at a contradiction but if i try to actually understand what is a square circle what is something that has four sides and also one side i it to me that's just senseless that's what almost what makes it a contradiction is the fact that no you you can't understand yeah what that is and you can understand it being you can understand it raining Mm -hmm. and you can understand it not raining Mm -hmm. but the idea of these two things happening at the same time yeah is something that I don't even think you can really understand what that means. So I think you can understand the concept, you can mm-hmm. understand the words, and it can feel like you've got a good idea okay. of it, but um, it's just that you actually don't. It's a bit like what William Lane Craig might do with actual infinites. We can conceive of them, but he thinks that actually, no, they're contradictory. I see. That's so I, th- I, th- I think it runs along those lines. Well, you now, know, in the interest in time, we might want to switch up to the next objection or whatnot, but do continue. I, I, you know, I, I must say I'm not surprised that an atheist like yeah. yourself is perfectly happy to allow contradictions. Uh, no, in, no, in, in no, I don't. Allow, no, that, no, that's, no. That's, that's, that's fine. Um, what I want to talk about is if we take this, conceiv- this greatest conceivable being, we can just grant for a moment that, you know, um, or putting what we've said to the side, um, just right. for now, to run the yeah, argument, yeah, yeah. To, to at least get it to its conclusion. Sure. Um, imagining the greatest conceivable being. Now, it's. I think it's useful a bit of terminology is that Anselm thinks that something can exist in multiple forms. Something can exist only in the mind. Something can exist in reality as well. So, so would this mean that if you describe something as, let's just say that we're saying the greatest conceivable Spider-Man, mm-hmm. um, there's nothing in that that says that he must exist. No, because you, you, you've got all you're asking really is what would be the greatest concept of Spider-Man um, in this realm of non-existence, right? Well, the greatest conceivable mm. Spider-Man for, for Anselm it would exist, but it would, would only exist. exist in the mind. Yes, right. So, so he uses the term slightly differently to how how we might use it, which is that like. If I say, do unicorns exist? Mm-hmm. You'll want to say no. It's like, well, they, they kind of exist conceptually. That's what Anselm means by existing in the mind. So unicorns for Anselm do exist. Mm-hmm. It's just that they only exist in the mind. See, I, I, I would respond as well. saying that, no, they do exist, if I'm going to run the lines of um, An- Anselm. Mm-hmm. So this brings us, of course, to one of those more famous objections, which you're putting on the table, of yeah. course, which is the perfect island. And with the perfect island, he's saying, look, you can apply this to the perfect island because yeah. if you can think of like a wonderful island, it's got all the things that you want, but it doesn't exist. Then I can think of something greater, namely that, mm. but it also exists. And what we're looking for is a symmetry breaker between why is it okay for Anselm to do that with God and not to do it with pizzas or islands. Right. So like what, where, where, what's got you across so the line for, on this For the sake of the audience, because we, we, I don't think we actually quite finished the argument, so the objection sure. might not make sense if they're not familiar already. The argument says, imagine the greatest conceivable being. Um, that that being exists in the Anselmian sense, exists in your mind because you're conceiving of it, right? It's the greatest conceivable thing. And so it exists in your mind. And then Anselm asks, does that thing also exist in reality? Does it exist in the real world? Mm-hmm. If you say no, then the thing you're thinking of, the thing you're conceiving of can be improved upon. It can be made greater by imagining that it also exists in reality. Yeah, I'm not so sure that's true. if you true. imagine something in the mind, which is the greatest conceivable being, and then I say, does that exist in reality? And you say no, then you're not doing what I asked you to do because I asked you to imagine the greatest conceivable being. So if you're imagining something that only exists in your mind, you can improve upon it. You have to, you have to by definition, imagine something that exists in reality. So by imagining the greatest conceivable being, mm-hmm. you're imagining something necessarily that exists in reality as well. And of course, 
the greatest conceivable being, you'll imagine it having, you know, maximal qualities. It will be powerful. It will be uh, knowledgeable. It will be loving. It will be moral. It will have all of these qualities. And so you're imagining something that's like maximally perhaps, you know, um, to, to the highest extent that's possible, powerful. That would be omnipotence. To the highest extent that's possible, knowledgeable. That's uh, omniscience. Also, that's only loving, to define the God and also as exists in reality. Omnipotent. Well, I'm I'm asking for the for, for it to just have this thing. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about God again. I I don't think I'm I've sorry. I yeah, sorry, I, sorry. I don't know, I don't know yeah, where yeah, this yeah, God's yeah, coming yeah. from. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm just talking about a being that you're conceiving of that has the maximum conceivable amount of of mm -hmm. all the properties that you could you could ascribe to it in the abstract. So, if I conceive of this being. Mm. And I say to you, yeah, I've got the greatest conceivable being of what what would be the most powerful being. Why is it that you say that it also must have existence? In reality? Yeah. Uh, because a being that only exists in your mind mm -hmm. is not as powerful as one that exists in reality, for instance. But if I'm thinking of the strongest concept, mm -hmm. then it would be fine. I, I would assume you'd follow. Like the strongest possible, say, the greatest possible Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't you say the greatest possible Spider-Man must exist? Well, this this then is where we land at, at Gornillo's. Gornillo's. I don't think anybody really knows how to say his name. I don't think anyone knows how to say any of these old names. We, like we, we, we just we just wrong with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Funny if we were just pronouncing them all wrong. I think that's likely. <laughs> and Selm, yeah. um, Descartes, maybe. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yep. So the the parody objection that you've just put up is this argument. This I, I imagine the greatest conceivable being, and then. If it exists only in the mind, it can be improved upon, mm -hmm. so it must exist in reality. You ask about the greatest conceivable Spider-Man, or the greatest conceivable pizza, mm -hmm. or as Gonello put it, the greatest conceivable island. Yep. So we imagine the great. Which one do you want to go with? The Spider-Man, the pizza. <sighs> let's go. Let's go Spider-Man. Let's go Spider-Man. Okay, Spider so so yeah, we imagine yeah. we'll we'll run the same argument. Imagine mm -hmm. the greatest conceivable Spider-Man. Yeah. Now, what we have to distinguish between is Anselm is not asking us to imagine the greatest conceivable God or the greatest conceivable man, or the greatest conceivable mm. creator, but the greatest conceivable thing. So everything that exists, be it Spider-Man pizzas, islands, gods, humans, whatever they are, they all fall within the category of thing. Yep. So if you're looking at the greatest possible thing, then, you know, what you're looking at is, if, if this coffee cup is, is part of thingness, it, it is a thing, can it be improved upon as a thing. Well, maybe if we kind of turned it into a, a glass, by some definitions, it might be improved upon as a thing. It wouldn't be improved upon as a coffee cup, nope. but it might be improved upon as a thing. Mm -hmm. So, we take something like Spider-Man. I'm, I'm actually not sure that's true, because they both exist. So mm -hmm. define thing. A thing is something that's not logically impossible. So it doesn't have to exist? It doesn't have to exist in reality, no. So you're defining a thing as something that's not a contradiction? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Which I think is... Maybe Anton wouldn't use the word thing there, but I think that's what he's talking about when yeah. he says things that's, can that, exist. Well, that's, in I, I see, like, I would define a thing as something that exists objectively. Okay, well, then you can you can say it's a concept instead or something like that if you prefer. Okay, so you think a concept so, is... So we can... Uh, yeah. a, a concept would be something on your terminology that exists only in the mind. It's sure. a thing that yep. exists only sure. in the mind. Sure. I like to think that unicorns, even though none exist in reality, mm -hmm. are still things. A unicorn is like... A unicorn is the thing that exists yes. in your mind, right? Yeah, that's yeah. how I'm using the term. And so we say, okay, well, what about... The, the maximally great Spider-Man. Well, first reason why this is disanalogous, in my view, is because we've gone from talking about the maximally great thing, just any thing that exists, mm -hmm. to a specific subset of things. The greatest conceivable Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be limited in terms of the qualities that are going to make something a better Spider-Man. Whereas, like, um, becoming, let's say, I don't know, some, some people might argue that, uh, that sacrificing your son right, mm -hmm. as, as Christianity teaches, makes you a greater thing mm -hmm. or a greater god or whatever. It doesn't make you a better Spider-Man, right? It's not a great making property of Spider-Man. Sure. Likewise, if you're talking about the greatest possible pizza... Mm -hmm. the reason I, 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 I tell you something that does make Spider-Man greater. Mm. He's actually a man. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we have something to say on uh, that too. I mean, our, our god and, is and, also and, a man. And, and man is defined as something that's a thing that exists objectively. So if you have in your mind the idea of Spider-Man mm -hmm. with all of these wonderful attributes, uh, I can think of something greater mm -hmm. because I'm defining Spider-Man as as a man, mm -hmm. as something that exists in reality. Oh, so if you if you fail to conceive of Spider-Man, if you if you try and conceive of Spider-Man uh, and you say that he exists as a concept, you're just not you're just not getting it, mate. Like, that's, that's not how I'm defining Spider-Man. That's because you're defining a man as 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 something that exists in reality. Yes. So Sherlock Holmes, mm -hmm. is he a man? 
Well, I would say that surely he must be. No. Because you can talk about Sherlock Holmes as a man. You can talk about Sherlock Holmes' parents. This you can is, talk no, about yeah, Sherlock is... Holmes' house and his and his and his car or whatever, you know? So you've got James Bond. Yeah. You've got Sherlock Holmes, mm-hmm. you know, the, in the spy area, let's say. Um, we can talk about which one of those are greater without ever referencing them actually existing. It, it doesn't jump to that at all. You can give me the greatest concept of Sherlock, mm-hmm. and then I can't improve on it by saying he exists in reality. Because I don't think that that's baked into the concept at all. I think you can have it completely in that realm. I think Anselm, and this is, the, again, Guanlo, Daniel Bonavec, mm-hmm. says that he just jumps from this to the other side. Descartes pointed this out as well. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't see, like, it, it seems to me that if you want to play this game where you're going to define God as something that exists, then I can just do it with unicorns. Because if, if you had a, you know, or Spider-Man, we're still with Spider-Man. Like, that's, that's my response to that. Now, I am just touching on the time. I've got one more response for you. But it I, depends I on whether or not you want I, to get a few I'd more on the table. Like, well, I'd like to get to the end of this, this particular objection. Sure. Um, in particular, for instance, you said that you could define a unicorn as existing or something like this. It's not so much that. What I would say is that a unicorn has a horn. Mm-hmm. It has a horn. Yeah. What does that mean? It means it, it, it exists. It well, must have the horn. The, you can have a horn in your mind, right? You can have a horn that doesn't exist. It's not how I'm defining it. Just, okay, so, so, just, you're just, yeah. so you're just defining a horn as something that has material existence. Yeah, it's part of the definition of the unicorn. Okay, in which case... Because if you can think if you think of one that doesn't have that, then it's, I can think of a greater unicorn. But you could say a greater unicorn is one that can exist in reality and the mind. So one that only exists in the mind, mm-hmm. a better unicorn is one that exists in the mind and reality. A unicorn that only exists in reality and not in the mind can be improved upon by existing in reality and in the mind. So do you think God exists in the mind and reality? In the mind and reality. Yeah, so I, could, so I could do the same with the unicorn. I'd go, yeah, it exists in the mind and... In which case yeah. you would have to say that the unicorn does exist as a thing in the mind. But this this is where I think that you've got a bait and switch going on with Anselm. Because if you're going def- to say that God has, as part of his definition, existence, and then say you've conceived of it, of, of God properly in your mind but he doesn't exist, then you just haven't got the concept of God well, in your mind. I'm, I guess I'm not defining God as something that exists, and, and I haven't even got to God yet, still. No, I no, mean, no, I you're still, not God at all. You're, you're, still, just, you're just on this even now, un, I, unembodied, un, you know, conscious entity know with God omnipotence, omnipresence, yeah. omnibenevolence. It's not God. But this is the beauty of it. I don't yeah. need to call it God, right? So, that, so, so the argument runs, look, if we take the pizza, for example. If it's not God, why have you given it omnipotence? Is it just... Because I'm just... Uh, I'm thinking about a, a maximally great being. So a being that has, or rather a greatest conceivable being. So I yeah. think that has the greatest conceivable amount of properties in the abstract. So power would be one example of something that it can have the greatest conceivable amount of, right? Yeah. So, I will give you the last word on this because I want to get another objection because I know there was sensitive time. And if people want more of the Cosmic Christian podcast and they want me on, then I get to hop on and we can like really delve into this yeah. stuff. So this, I, this will be, I don't know why you're laughing. Like this is I, really serious yeah, stuff. Sorry, sorry. I should yeah, stop. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Come on, come on. I, I wanted to say, uh, let's take the pizza because I think it's a clearer example Go to on. get this point across. What are the, what are the things that make a pizza great? What are the great making properties of a pizza? Well, there's one problem, which is that like pizzas can't have intrinsic maximum. So like if you say, well, I think that makes a pizza great is that it has cheese, right? It's like, that you can always add more cheese. You can always make the pizza bigger. You can make mm-hmm. it bigger and bigger and bigger to, to no end, mm-hmm. right? There's no, like, maximum. That's, like, one objection. Uh, whereas, like, for something like the maximally conceivable being, it would just be, like, whatever the most power a thing can have, that's the top maximum, and Ooh. that's that's what you give it. Oh, no. But it's actually a less interesting objection than the one we were already talking about, which is... I don't, I, that's where I want to go. Okay, well, we can go there next then, right? Go for it. So allow me to finish this objection first. If we talk about this pizza... And we say, okay, well, let's imagine the maximally conceiv- the you know, the greatest conceivable pizza. Okay, the greatest conceivable pizza as a category of thing will have specific great making properties: cheesiness, roundness, you know, um, the amount of pepperoni it's got, you, wait, something you, like this. It's got pineapple on, right? <laughs> if you like, yeah. No, no, it does. It, it definitely does. If it's the greatest possible pizza. Okay, so this is okay. So the the problem you're getting at is that like there's no objective way to say what makes a pizza greater. Precisely. Which actually just means that you're not able, it's like conceptually incoherent to talk about a maximally great pizza. And so your objection doesn't work. And I don't think we can talk about a maximally great being. But when we're talking about great here, Mm -hmm. right, what I'm talking about is just has the, has more of the like, just has more of any property you can ascribe to a thing in the abstract. What about mutually exclusive properties? Such as? Okay. So you have in your mind, let's say, not God, but like quite close to God, mm-hmm. right? Is that fair? Then I've got God, but sorry, not God, quite close to God. Your concept of the greatest possible being would express his omnibenevolence with pure justice. 
Mm-hmm. So he will say, look, um, it's always an eye for an eye. I'm never going to take a tooth for an eye. Like justice is enacted. That is what I'm always going to do. My concept of the greatest possible benevolent being is one, let's say, in contrast, that has maximal mercy. So I think that he shows mercy whenever he can. Mm -hmm. So it's not an eye for an eye. You have mutually exclusive concepts there. And how do you cash this out? Is there now, have we just argued for polytheism? I or think, how is that going to manifest? Does God have these mutually exclusive properties? You're giving up the law of non-contradiction? Like, what's, go- what's going down on that front? I think one potential way around that is to say that, like, there's kind of an epistemic problem here, which is that if we're looking for maximal morality within a being, we don't know what the balance of justice to mercy would be in a maximally moral being. But we could say that there is a right answer to that. Let's say if there is such thing as objective morality, which obviously we haven't got there yet. S- sorry, that means you can't conceive of it. Uh, yes, you can, because like with the like with the thousand-sided chase, sure. you can just understand what it means to have a maximally moral being. Mm-hmm. You don't know whether that's going to cash out in mm-hmm. terms of justice or mercy. You don't know what the balance is going to be. But what I'm talking about is just whatever the right answer to that question is, is a property of that God. You might not be able to like know exactly what that property is, but yeah. you know that whatever it is, it's going to have... Did I say God? There, I finally yeah, said Yeah, you did. You, you went there. You went there. Finally, yeah, yeah. like, that that will be ascribed to that feel that cathartic? I feel good. Like, yes. Uh, yeah, good. good. Now, of course, of course, there's yeah, going yeah. to be an epistemic problem here that we yeah. don't know whether it's going to be justice or mercy and mm-hmm. what the balance is going to be between the two. Mm. But if there is such thing as objective morality, which mm-hmm. we can get to later, mm-hmm. then, but which at least you'll understand the Christian will accept, then there is a right answer to that question. And the maximal, maximally moral being will just have whatever the correct answer is to that question, right? Yeah, I, I don't buy that. Okay. So, so if you've got like the thousand-sided dice, mm-hmm. okay, you understand the concept. And fortunately, you can figure out whether or not there's a contradiction involved. But you don't, you don't, un- you, while you understand it, you don't actually conceive of it. Mm-hmm. Because you can't. It's just too many, it's just with the apparatus that God gave us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it just doesn't, doesn't allow us to compute in that way. Okay. Likewise, when we start thinking of a square circle, now, well, slightly different here you think of a square circle you can conceive of you can understand it but you actually can't conceive of it my point here is that you think you can conceive of the greatest possible being right it it makes sense to you logically but i would say that i'm not convinced that that's true i actually think that aquinas might be where where to get off which is on premise one just there's, there's i'm a, not sure you can do that there's a careful distinction yeah. that needs to be made here you said you might not be able to conceive of the greatest possible being mm-hmm. which is true but you can conceive of the greatest conceivable being, which is what Anselm's asking you to do. And I think that's in the realm of fiction. But surely you can conceive of the greatest conceivable being. Yeah, but like... By I don't, definition. But, but as we go back again, I don't know why he would f- not fall into the realm of Sherlock. I can think of the greatest possible Spider-Man. It do- mm. I don't need him to okay, exist. Okay, so, so that's, where, that's where I wanted to finish the earlier okay, yeah, objection, yeah, 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 go. which is let's take the pizza, only because it's kind of so different from, from mm-hmm. a god that I think it's easier to make the point. Mm-hmm. And then if you don't think it applies to Spider-Man or Sherlock Holmes, we can do that too, but... So a pizza is going to have certain, uh, wh- like, whatever you're saying when you say a great, a maximally great pizza or a greatest conceivable pizza, mm-hmm. whatever those properties are that you think makes it a greater pizza, we, again, there'll be an epistemic problem here. If there's an objective truth to it, we don't know whether it'll have pineapple on it or mm-hmm. not, right? No, it, it will. Fine. Okay. Whatever, whatever yeah, yeah, you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The great making properties of a pizza yeah. will not include existence in reality. It will. Because existing in reality might make it, like, have more existence might make it a greater mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. but it doesn't make it a greater pizza yes it does because it still has all of the properties of a pizza when it exists in your mind no i disagree even even it tasting nice it yeah. tastes nice it could be nutritional it could be cheesy it can be round it can be you know define, define, define taste uh tasty uh just means like okay when eaten is is pleasant so you have to eat, to eat it. it so it's got to exist uh, it, it, yeah, it exists. Okay, so the in the mind. Exists. It exists in the mind. Oh, okay, so you eat it mentally. Yeah. And then you get the taste. Yeah. So if you was to eat, never have eaten pizza and then you eat it in the mind, you would actually get the taste of pizza. Here's, here's how to put, here's yeah, how yeah, to yeah. put it into, into words, I think. Uh, the, the conceptual pizza is tasty in the same way that Sherlock Holmes' front door is black. And, the, and, and also that God is all-powerful. Uh, no, not quite. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, because like I think that's just a really cool superhero. I don't think it has to exist. Well, we can we can pin down this objection. Do, would you agree that Sherlock Holmes's front door is black? No. You, so what color is it? 
it's like it's within a conceptual frame. Like to say that it is black is to say that he has a door and it's black. He doesn't have a door. Well, he does it have does, a door. Sherlock Holmes no, has a door. No, see, I think that you're just you're confused on the topic. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes has a door. No. Sherlock Holmes has hands. But this is where the this is where the bait and switch is happening. Define mm. door. Uh, a door is uh, some kind of like object on a hinge that allows you to enter a premises. Let's and say. does the hinge exist? In the mind, yes. Yeah, you see, like... It can so, also exist so in reality. It can also exist yeah, in reality. Yeah, it can do. It okay, can cool. exist in reality. It can exist but it, in the but mind. But that's not a necessary property. No, it's not a necessary property of being a door. Yeah, so right? like the way you define it there, then yeah, you can say he's got he's got a door. Right, so Sherlock yeah. Holmes has a door. And mm-hmm. so the, the objection might be something like, well, surely to make it a uh, like the greatest conceivable door, it would exist in reality. No, because you just said it doesn't necessarily have the property of existing. Which is, which is exactly my point, which is to say, right, okay. if you're going to make the objection, yeah. you know, well... If you want to imagine the greatest conceivable door, surely that must exist in reality. Mm-hmm. No, because the properties of doorness mm-hmm. can be kind of maxed out mm. in conceivability alone. Making that door exist in reality doesn't make it more of a door. All it does mm. is it makes it more of a thing, right? But if you define a door as something that exists in reality, or you keep you have a component that already presupposes that, mm-hmm. then you are going to define it into existence. This is where the unicorn and the Spider-Man comes in. Sure. So, if, but but again. This is why this objection might work to a different form of the ontological argument. Mm-hmm. But Anselm's just, uh, he's not trying to say, imagine a being that exists in reality. That's not what he's doing. That's like the conclusion of his argument. What he's doing is just imagine the greatest conceivable thing. But but th- that's why he gets accused of begging the question, mm-hmm. right? Because, I, actually, I'm getting slightly confused with, with Descartes here. Because if you define God to have, if you define God as existing, even if you hide it in like he's got property X, but X yeah. is something that necessarily has existence as a property, yeah. you're just begging the question. The first premise is done it. That's what that's what Descartes does, and I think he does beg yeah. the question in that respect. Yeah. But I don't think that's what Anselm does. Or he's expressing something that's completely trivial, mm. which is like, yeah, if you conceive of God, then okay, fine. Well, he's saying, again, let's let's kind of get rid of the God talk. Yeah. Let's just say greatest conceivable being. So yeah. let, let's follow the argument. We've got mm. Imagine the greatest conceivable thing. Define being. I, I'd rather use the word thing, which I just define in the same way. Okay. I define them interchangeably here. So okay, a being or a thing yeah, is just yeah, something yeah. Okay, that cool, isn't logically cool. yep, contradictory. Okay, okay, yeah, yep. So the greatest conceivable thing, right? And, and basically the ontological argument runs that, well, that thing must exist in reality as well as the mind. Mm-hmm. You object that, well, what about a parody of another thing, like a door or a pizza or a Spider-Man? The maximally great door must exist in reality too, right? No, because mm. it's not more of a door by making it exist in reality. But let me just finish the objection here. I'll run it to its conclusion, then I'll give you the final word. Sure. So the objection runs like this. There's a difference between something being a greater door in regards to doorness Mm -hmm. and being a greater door in regards to thingness. So there's a Latin word called qua, which which I like to use. So like something can be greater qua door or greater qua thing. So take a door that exists in your mind Mm -hmm. only, and then take another door, door two, which exists in the mind and in reality. The door that only exists in your mind, mm-hmm. oh, sorry, the, the door two, the one that exists in reality as well, is not a greater door than the one that only exists in the mind because existing in, in reality doesn't make it a greater door. But it does make it a greater thing because if you're talking about the greatest possible thing, mm-hmm. you're maxing out not just the qualities of being a door, mm-hmm. but of just properties in general, which mm-hmm. would include existence in reality. So door two is greater than door one. But it's not a greater door; it's a greater thing. So that the object, so what the objection does, I think, is actually leads us back to Anselm's conclusion, which is, okay, so the greatest conceivable door, qua door, mm-hmm. exists in the mind. Does it need to exist in reality? No. Well, how do we make it exist in reality? Well, maybe we say that a, a, a door that exists in reality as well is a greater thing, qua thing, rather than qua door. Mm-hmm. But now you're talking about improving the thing that exists in your mind, qua thing. And the door that exists in reality is a better door qua thing, but how can we make it a better thing? Because now we're just talking about thingness. Well, we can improve upon the door, again, not qua door, but qua thing, by giving that door maximal power, by giving that door maximal knowledge, by giving it maximal ethics, this kind of stuff. And then where do you end up? You end up in the same place Anselm ended up. So you're either talking about the greatest possible door as a door, in which case the parody doesn't work. It doesn't need to exist in reality. It can exist only in the mind. Or you say, no, the door must exist in reality as well, because that makes it a greater thing, but then you're not talking about the greatest possible door anymore. You're t- talking about the greatest possible thing, and that would lead you right to the big G-O-D. Okay. What do you think? Uh, I think we're going to repeat the same ground. Okay. But hopefully I can do it in a, from a different angle. Hmm. So, 
door. Door. And then you've got this greatest thing. You want to say that the thing has omnipotence, omnipresence, omnibenevolence. Yeah, the greatest conceivable thing. So that. you're saying that the thing has these, right? Mm-hmm. Door. What does it have? Hinge. Mm-hmm. Made of wood, yeah. right? The, the whole argument is whether or not it has... It has existence, right? That's what's being expressed in, in reality. Just yeah. to be clear, yeah, yeah, yeah. But does, does it have that? If you define either the being or the door as something that has existence as part of its definition, or something that's baked in as a presupposition or as an implicit premise, mm-hmm. then it does follow that the greatest possible version of that does exist in reality. Whereas if you don't have that baked in, as mm-hmm. you were saying, then you can have it. So the greatest possible door doesn't necessarily have to have existence. The greatest possible Sherlock doesn't have to have necessary existence. I I I would say the door, if you've if you've got a concept of a door and it's just some concept in your mind, it's it's not got it's not something that exists. I don't think you're conceiving of a door. Mm-hmm. That's the move that I see being done. I think that thing, just as you chose some attributes for what you wanted to give God, mm. sorry, not God, whatever it might be, mm. right? I think that you you have to choose these attributes for what you're going to give yeah. door, and I I don't I'm, I mean maybe the audience can let us know we can go again. So as as my but friend yeah. as my friend Bill once said, final word to you, then we'll move on. My my friend Bill, um, uh, known more popularly as William Lane Craig, of course. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> what you're doing, Steve, is yeah. you're demonstrating the intellectual price tag yeah. of atheism, which to me is that manifold mistakes. In, in order, manifold, manifold, mistake, manifold, 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 manifold mistakes. In order, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, in yeah. order to reject this this objection to your objection, mm. right, which is my way of getting around it from the Anselmian perspective, which is yeah. that like, look, a door can exist only in the mind and still be the greatest possible door. It can be improved upon as a thing by making it ex- exist in reality, but mm-hmm. you can make it a better thing then by, you know, making it God, essentially. Um, you're saying, well, the way around that is to say that when you're imagining a door that only exists in your mind, you're not imagining a door. You're welcome to do that, but it commits you to the view that, for instance, you have to say that Sherlock Holmes doesn't have hands. Sherlock Holmes doesn't have a door. And I understand the intuition that he doesn't because you're like, well, he's kind of a fictional character, so yeah. he doesn't literally have a door. But there's, no, there's, there's no price for I that. think it still makes sense conceptually to say that if I were to say that, like, Sherlock Holmes, like, is not a man... <laughs> um, th- this was this was the ploy. I just wanted to talk about, you know, what like the the definition of what makes something a man. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the <laughs> the <laughs> well, you've now got into the Christian like, you <laughs> yeah, know, I'm like really, I'm really trying on the Christian. Yeah, well, you for, really want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's good. If I were to say Sherlock Holmes doesn't have hands, I think I'd be mistaken. I think I'd, I think that would be incorrect. Whereas that would imply that okay, so if it's incorrect that Sherlock Holmes doesn't have hands, that means Sherlock Holmes has hands, and that means that that would be a true statement. Whereas you would have to say. That that's not a true statement, right? Sherlock Holmes doesn't have hands. I'd say you're confusing the map for the place, basically. It's, that's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, it's, it's just coming um, down to your, like, yeah. But, but I think we're going to traverse I think the same this, ground. This is actually the, but yeah. that's, that's gone quite full circle. And yeah. I, I, think, I think we've done quite well there. I'll be interested to see in the comments what you will make of it, you, yeah. you, you large atheist audience of mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, at yeah. least for now. Um, they will convert. They will. They will. Do you reckon they're, like, this time next year, be April 1st again, of course, Mm. Do you think that you can probably convert about 50% of them? Maybe. By yeah. then, at the very least. That's by, ri- by the next time. I do yeah, I don't want to see at least, at least 42 uh, interviews if you've done with different Christians. Okay, like if you don't do yeah. that, I'll actually be very unhappy. I'm very excited for this time next year on April 1st when you'll see the first episode of the Cosmic Carnist podcast. Oh, yes, that's going to be arguing great. Arguing against all the yeah. vegan sophisms. Um, that's going to be fun too. Maybe it's, you can come on for that as they, well. They're like. such hypocrites, aren't they? Yeah, I can't believe it. Like vegans, when they eat like, tomatoes, they got to kill things. They kill, you know, you kill animals, right? Yeah. And so I, I also, I find that if you just put your fingers in your ears and you ignore mm. actually the ethos they're expressing and you yeah. pretend they're making something else. Yeah. I mean, that's what I do as an atheist, of course. I straw man all these arguments. It's not that we can have rational disagreement yeah. that's going to end up with me in hell. No, no, no. It, it actually what it is is that. I'm a pretty nasty individual. Yeah. Probably deserve hell anyway. Definitely. So, well, we all yeah. deserve hell. I deserve yeah, yeah. hell. Well, Jesus sure, deserves. Do make sure no, that Jesus you f- doesn't deserve hell. That was no, really no, that really was, a no, 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 um, no, no. But he took it anyway for you. Yeah, I mean, like he didn't really die though, did he? Well, he did. I mean, what's a sacrifice if you don't really get sacrificed? Well, bear in yeah, mind, yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve, that when Jesus was up upon that tree, he did not mm. just suffer the physical excruciation of mm. crucifixion, but also the moral weight of every single human being's sin. Is Jesus God? Yes. What, what? How do you conceive of God actually suffering? Like an omnipotent being, if you can conceive of an omnipotent being that can suffer, 
I can think of one that's a bit stronger, you know, namely one that can't suffer. So what's going I on? I think there? that's all we have time for. Thank you all for watching uh, today today's episode. <laughs> 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 okay, we, we we can we can talk about the Trinity if you like because I was going to say it's, loads, it, it's, it's 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 yeah. my I'm going to throw it over to you. Sue. I, I've had a I've had a well, fair shot at, at presenting an argument to uh, you in favor of in favor of the Christian worldview or at least a a broad theism. Um, but yes, Jesus Jesus sacrifice was a was a real one. And as I believe C.S. Lewis said, mm -hmm. he died as much for you books, yeah. individually oh, individually as if you had been the only person I'm, alive. I'm so ungrateful. On I'm just not using my mind right. You of know? course not. I'm you know, incredibly the, biased. The gates of hell are locked from the inside. They really are. Mm. And like, and guess I mean, what? Yeah, you've got the key, Steve. I've got the key. You've I don't. I key. don't know what it is. I use my mind. I think about this more than most people. Mm. And like, despite you know people wanting to say that you know I'm straw manning or whatever it might be. No, I'm really trying, but maybe I'm just so made. I think Blaise Pascal just, put it. Just... I'm just so made for hell. Mm. Like, that's where I'm going. And yeah, oh, I'm glad you said it. Yeah, I did say it. And it's just like, I'm really glad that an all-powerful, loving God created me in such a way. Yeah, isn't it, isn't yeah. it a fascinating divine mystery mm. that somehow a person mm. as, as uh, you know, well-human as yourself deserves suffering in hell? But of course, yeah. uh, you know, I take the, uh, yeah. uh, the annihilationist position yeah. of hell. I don't believe that there's a physical place called hell. Yeah. I think that... Uh, oh, so you're not going to define hell as a... As it doesn't have... A, it's not a thing. No, I think hell is just separation from God. Oh, I see. You're going to annihilationist. Hell is, hell is not a place. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, an yeah, annihilationist. Yeah. I, I think yeah, that yeah. God, is, uh, God is the ground of all being, right? As the contingency yeah. argument says, God is like every... All thingness, like physical mm. matter and stuff, it, it's all contingently resting upon a necessary being. So everything that exists, exists yeah. because God is its ground. So if you choose separation from God by rejecting his message and his son... Which I do, yeah, yeah. ...then you reject God, and if God is the basis of everything that is, mm -hmm. then what you end up in is a place of non-existence. Rather than a hell, I think you end up just, just dying and not existing, not inheriting eternal life, because nothing can exist separate from God. So yeah, um, you don't enough. need to worry too much. I mean, I will miss you. No, you know, no, 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 I, I, I appreciate that. But first, I'm sure after, you. you know, I'll probably forget about you after at least, you know, 100,000 years. I would think so. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, because actually, if you suffered at all, it's not really heaven, is it? So you really probably shouldn't suffer. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I necessarily I must also kind of think that you deserve hell. So yeah, you, you, you you'll see do. you'll yeah. see that as you go up there and you go, no, actually, fair enough, he is condemned. And I like rightfully so. So, you know, goodbye, Steve. You yeah, know, you don't yeah, that's that's be fine. great fun. Yeah. Now I've got a question for you, good sir. Please. Offer a few questions your way, okay? Because you, you you text me well, down in Portsmouth, which is lovely, mm. and you were like, Listen, Steve, I'm a Christian now. Uh do you want to chat about like? Do you want to chat yeah. about all these arguments? I don't want mm. you laughing. Like, Sorry. Yeah, stop it. So you <laughs> you said, look, Steve, do you want to come talk about these things? Like, you can have maybe two days to prepare. I'm going to throw out all of these great arguments imbued from what I've learned in the academy against your YouTube knowledge. Mm. And I thought that's a great idea. How could that go wrong? So I found a little bit of extra time to throw some questions your way. And and, and here's one. Okay, Alex, be honest with me. Did you give up naturalism because you're just tired of all the sex and parties? Is that was that like you just wanted not to sin? Yes, uh, I had a mm. I had a brief intermediary period. I mean, look, it, it's all very mm. overrated, you know. When you've had as as much partying and sex as I have, yes. Steve, you realise that it's all very overrated. Yeah. A lot of studies actually seem to show that uh, Christians are more sexually satisfied than atheists because yeah. committing yourself truly to one person. And waiting until marriage actually uh, brings you significantly more fulfillment when Good. you realise what yeah. sex is really about, which is love. And you'll you'll link that empirical data, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah I'll, I'll put it down yeah. in the in the doobly doo. Excellent, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a in Augustine's Confessions. There's uh, he he recounts how because he you know he wasn't born a Christian. Um, well, debatable. That, yeah. Um, he converted to Christianity, and there was a period before he was Christian where he started to think that Christianity might be true. And so he prayed to God. He said, God, please help me to give up my lustful desires, to give up, you know, the earthly pleasures, to give up sex and money and all this kind of stuff. But not yet, because mm. I'm enjoying it too much. He, he, he wanted, yeah. And I was in a similar boat, you know. Mm. Well, but but mm. you realize that, you know, a, a theologically dedicated uh, life is far more, far more awe inspiring and, and fulfilling than any kind of vacuous, mindless, carnal pleasures. It's materialism, isn't it? It's just, mm. it's gone haywire. Yeah. You know, like as, as a Christian, you probably really like capitalism, but you're, you're quite happily poo on materialism. And, yeah. And, yeah. Well, well, people, okay, people say, you know, atheists yeah, yeah, yeah. just want to sin. And yeah. I think it's true. Christians want to sin as well. Everybody wants to sin every yeah. now and again. You want to yeah. commit sins every day. So saying 
atheists just want to sin isn't untrue. Everybody likes to sin, mm. but according to the Christian definition of sin. People like to have casual sex. People like to, you know, eat shellfish. People like to... Oh, um, yeah, tattoos. They like tattoos. People like tattoos, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I nearly got, uh, what was it, Leviticus 19, 12, 19, 18... <sighs> Tattooed onto my arm, just, would, for, just been, for the irony. Yeah, that would have been annihilationism, though. You would have, yeah. uh, at least, my left arm would have made it to heaven. That's true, actually. Yeah, because um, then we got a topic of you know whether or not you are a whole or parts. Yes. and like maybe your your left arm, <laughs> that and like if you touch yourself with your right arm, maybe that's gone, right? That, that, that's <laughs> and, what's happened. And maybe another yeah, yeah. part of your body as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think yeah. So look, atheists do just want to sin, but so do Christians. And so mm. the question is, how do we respond to this desire we have within us to do things that we all know somewhere deep down are, are wrong? Well, yeah. one option is to just throw off morality and allow yourself to indulge in them. The other is to say, no, listen to your intuitions and accept the saving grace of uh, Christ our Lord. Yeah, like, um, so obviously atheists struggle with this as well. And I think, like, I think the best way to deal with these kind of issues is, say I wronged you, right? I stole from you, I stole your guitar and whatnot, mm. okay? Now, I'm sure you'd be very upset about that. But rather than replacing your guitar or, you know, like saying to you, earnestly, I'm sorry, like, I don't know what came over me and I regret it. I can actually just ignore you, uh, let you get on with your life, mm -hmm. and I can just pray. And I, ju I just feel like that's such an easier path to redemption. Mm. It's not embarrassing. You know, I don't actually have to take too much on for myself because I made amends with God. Quite frankly, who the hell are you? I don't need to make, you know, amends with you. So like, I can I can see the appeal there. Yeah. So I've got a second question for you because mm -hmm. that was just a, a, pre I would, a preliminary. I would just say in response yeah. to that, if I may, yeah. oh, that... To make amends with God, to, to repent of your sin, mm. requires genuine recognition of wrongdoing. That is, in order yeah. to, to actually repent, God God can see your thoughts, man. Like, he knows if you're really sorry. And so the question is, mm. if you stole my guitar and took it away and knew I was upset, but then were genuinely sorry for it, you mm. might think, well, I can just say sorry to God and not bother with this Alex guy. Yeah. But if you were genuinely sorry, if you really did regret what you did, I think you would want to come and say sorry to me because you, you being willing to just be like, oh, he can suffer on his own, really is an indication that you're not truly sorry at all, which means God wouldn't accept your apology either. Well, you know, I guess I could say that actually I think that in the grand scheme of things that all is going to be set right, all is well, mm. as Voltaire put in his wonderful poem. Mm. Uh, and that is that God will rectify this. Like, he, he knows the conditions that we're under. He knows yeah. that people are going to suffer. It's part of the theodicy, right? And so he's going to correct it. Um, and is, if God knows that I'm genuinely sorry, mm -hmm. then that's sufficient. Sure. But, I mean, like, we can have like Christian, you know, debates here on on, on our takes on this. But I think, you know, I'm mm. more interested in hearing your, uh, your yeah, next question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my next question would be, you've you've pushed a lot on veganism recently, mm. okay? And uh, I mean, it's, it's a dreadful religion. It's really corroded your mind. Yeah. Like you used to be rational and logical. That's probably... You haven't be, had B12, have you? That makes so much That's sense. how you've turned oh, to Christianity. God, because you accept the religion of veganism and then before you know it, you're accepting oh. every religion under the sun. La there's going to be a direct correlation Dear between me. lack of protein and theism. Yeah. Yeah, and that explains why they're obsessed with the man image, right? Mm. Because they're lacking in that fundamental category. Yeah, even though yeah, uh, yeah, meat yeah, eaters yeah, yeah. on average have more... Uh, Mm. vitamin deficiencies than vegans do they just have no i don't i actually don't I, I don't know that's not a thing that's that's that. part of the propaganda yeah. that you're expressing oh, and i'm not right. anyway like you're, you're detracting from my question man like sorry I'm not really yeah, appreciate is, I'm no 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 it's, it's the veganism you just can't help it so animal suffering before we existed yes we had billions you, you always existed steve even before you were formed in the womb god knew you Okay, that's that's really nice. Before so, you existed in, have in, I existed forever? Before you existed in reality. Okay, every, um, oh, before I was a thing. Yeah. So I existed not as a thing. Well, that, okay, that, Sherlock that Holmes exists. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Okay. So animal suffering. Mm. Before we're born. Yeah. There is billions and billions of years of evolution. Mm. Well, yeah, billions, and that we. I mean, evolution is a wonderful process. It's incredibly elegant, but it is, it is. To, to borrow a line from Sam Harris, like the process itself causes suffering on a scope and scale that would embarrass the most ambitious psychopath. Mm. And yet you believe, I assume, because you accept evolution, yes. that God put this into, into, into action. Quite right. So my question would be, how is it that you square all the suffering that we see around us when 
because you can't even blame it on human sin because we don't exist at that point, right? Mm. I'm talking before humans because that tends to be how Christians respond. They tend to go, oh, we can do it because of sin. I'm like, no, 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 before we existed because then they have to bite the bullet of going, actually, I'm a creationist. But most most respectful yeah. Christians don't do well, that. Well, it may still be because yeah. you have to remember that for God, we're talking about an atemporal being. So although human beings only started to evolve a few million years ago and mm. animals have been evolving for about 4.5 billion, mm -hmm. um, if the reason that animals suffer is because we live in a fallen world and we live in a fallen world because mm -hmm. of Adam's sin, whatever this Adam might be in an evolutionary picture, I believe William Lane Craig has a, mm -hmm. has a book coming out soon uh, on the historical Adam. He does. Um, then you could still say that even though human beings didn't temporally exist yet, uh, because God is atemporal, he knows that man sins, that's why we're in a fallen world, and so all of those animals are suffering for that reason. That's not a theodicy I would use. I, I was just going to say, does that mean that he knows all of the future then? From, yes, God okay, knows all the future. So he has an actual infinite in his, in his head? Uh, no, because the, the, the timeline of, of the universe isn't going to go on forever, because at some point it's going to come to an end uh, at the final judgment. Well, he knows all of heaven as well, which is forever. Yes, but that that's a more complicated subject because uh, you know we don't know if, if heaven kind of operates in the same temporal quality of, of of living existence. We don't know if it's going to be kind of like one day, then the next, then the next, or a minute, then the next, then the next. You might kind of experience a temporal yeah. existence or something like that. So possibly there so might be. So you'd still have the there. infinite set. Well, you'd have a you'd have a potential infinite um, rather than an no, actual infinite. No, it'd have to be actual if God's conceiving of it. If God can conceive of the future, mm. such as Adam. It follows that he can conceive of all the future steps. I surely. think there are two ways around this. The first is to say that heaven essentially exists atemporally. So mm -hmm. in the way that God exists atemporally. Just, just so curious, you, you any other examples of anything existing atemporally? Uh, no. Okay, carry on. Carry no, on. I don't, because yeah, yeah. time is... A, well, perhaps the singularity before the Big Bang, or the singularity at the, at the, at the middle of black holes. I'm not a physicist. So but just, just hypotheses, basically. If like time just, is... Out of nowhere, kind of thing. If but, time is a well, mm. I think that's what you think, Steve. Oh, of course, out of nowhere, oh, out of nowhere for no reason. Um, well. For no reason, for no indeed. Reason. Yeah, yeah. I think that if if time is a quality of the universe, as Einstein showed, and that it can be affected, so the more mass something has, it kind of uh, slows down time. Then, if you have a point of infinite density, perhaps <laughs> you've got essentially a, a timeless thing. So maybe that would be. Do so you think example, general relativity is correct? Um, it's well, I, I couldn't say that with certainty. It seems uh, yeah, to be the best it, it would description you that we have so far of the universal laws. Okay, well, it would put you at odds with like our best physicists because basically we know that, that, that Sean Carroll, Roger Penrose, they basically express that we know that Einstein's theory does not work. Fine, but, we, but it's not compatible but they with quantum mechanics, for instance. But they wouldn't deny, for instance, the time warping effects of mass or something like that. Yeah, that we experience with right. within within this area. But it's, it's a it's part of everything, yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. peripheral point anyway. I mean, even But if, if you were to use it to apply to the grand cosmos, mm. that would be fallacious because yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so too. Mm. But if I mean, even if there were no other example of a timeless thing, mm -hmm. I also can't think of another example of an omnipotent thing. I think that would be contradictory, no, I mean, it, yeah, but I don't think yeah. that's special pleading because that's not part of an argument. No. Um but okay, so so where were we? Uh, God exists atemporally, so your objection that, well, God must know an actual infinite if he knows all the future. Two mm -hmm. ways around that. The first is to say that in heaven you exist essentially atemporally in the same way that God does. So there is no but even infinite But you don't, you don't need time in order to have an actual infinite. That's true, but, but heaven wouldn't be a necessarily an actual infinite if it were if there's any, if there's any if there's a set of any type. Mm. So you said that you, would, you, know, you experience it mm -hmm. as if it's like time, but it's not time. Well, you still have an infinite set. That he well, maybe, can see maybe, the future maybe you off. don't experience it as time. Maybe mm. and like Wes Morriston and a couple others of uh, Alex Malpass and mm -hmm. uh, Joe Schmid, like they've emphasised very much that the potential infinite uh, presupposes the actual infinite. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and, I like and, that argument. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually something that I put to my friend Bill as well um, yeah. in a previous podcast episode available yeah, via yeah. the link in the description. Beautiful. Um, I think the other way around it is William Lane Craig, his, his way around it was to say that at creation, God actually entered time. Mm -hmm. So God is now not a timeless being. He's, yeah. he's, he's a timed being. Yeah. Um, that has some implications as to like divine foreknowledge and free will. But he essentially, and I, I'd imagine that if you imagine a version of heaven that's like a new earth, so kind of earth is, is reformed and the heaven basically exists within the universe we already have. It's just mm. ultimately destroyed and re reborn. Then you have... Sure, a potential infinite number of days that human beings are experiencing, but also God is experiencing too. So God becomes a timed being. But I, I think we can discuss this more if you like. Well, you know, we're but, getting, how do you know when you're talking to a vegan, you won't actually talk about veganism. So please get <laughs> back to the to, to yeah. the vegan comment, right? Um, how do you know? How do you know when someone has a nut allergy? Don't worry, they'll tell you. It's like, <laughs> yeah. like yeah, 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 yeah. It's <laughs> um, true. It's true. I think. Uh, 
Okay, so animal suffering. Yeah, yeah, big problem. Big, big problem. Which, by the way, if you think it is such a big problem, then yeah. um, I only have to ask you, Steve, why it is mm. that... I mean, if, if you're going to point the finger at God and say, yeah. how could he possibly be so evil as to force these animals to undergo the suffering that they do? Billions yeah. of them, then, well, I mean, Mr. Vegetarian. Yeah. I could point the finger at you and say, well, how can you call yourself oh, a moral being oh, we'll, still consuming... Uh, well, we'll expand and, upon this in, in the video that's coming on my channel. That's right. This, this another another video on, on Steve's own Where channel. I've converted to paganism. <laughs> so, yes. Um, yeah. To continue. Animal suffering. Um, there are a few ways to get around it. I mean, one I mean, one idea is the neo-Cartesian view, which is that like animals either don't suffer at all or suffer in a way that's much less morally significant. This is the line that someone, again, William Lane Craig takes this line. C.S. Lewis has flirted with this view. There are some yeah. uh, more, uh, like other contemporary thinkers who do the same thing. I think the idea that animals don't feel pain at all, that mm -hmm. they're just mechanistic, is 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 vacuous it, it's ridiculous okay i think that they they do or at least we have no good reason to think that they don't yeah. and we should give them the benefit of the doubt um so, there is so richard swinburne's response to this is not the path you're going to take i don't think so no yeah. okay cool i think what i would rather do is enter the discussion with a discussion of the problem of evil more generally mm -hmm. so one way around all forms of the problem of evil is that of skeptical theism yep. which is the idea that Let's just suppose that mm -hmm. I could give you absolutely no explanation of why it is that God allowed all of these animals to suffer sure. in the way that they did for billions of years to bring about human existence. Yep. We don't know. This is true in many human contexts. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are theodicies to explain human suffering, but it seems like this particular instance of suffering, it seems impossible to confidently explain why God would allow that to, to take place. But mm. the question is this. If there were an explanation... For all, the, all of this suffering, if there were a reason, I'd rather say, that all, all of this suffering somehow had to take place or was justified in being allowed to take place, it doesn't follow that we should expect to be able to understand what that reason is. Yes. Right? And so it's at least conceivably possible that God does have perfectly good justification mm -hmm. for all of the suffering that he's invigilated. Mm -hmm. And that when we cry out to, to understand why it's been allowed to take place... Mm -hmm. God is simply in a position of not being able to explain it to us. Much like, you know, the, the classic example of the dentist, the child being yep. taken to the yep. dentist. Yep. You can't explain to the child, because it's too young to understand, why they have to undergo the suffering. But you know that it's worth it. Maybe maybe one day when the child gets old, older, you'll be able to explain to them and they'll understand why they needed to go to the dentist. And maybe one day when we inherit eternal glory, we'll finally you, understand. You, not me. But Sorry. Yeah. 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 We, we, the Christians. Yeah, you, the Christians. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll understand so I, it. I just never understand yeah. it. Yeah. Never, never. You'll have to take that to the grave with you, unfortunately. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that that's, that's one way around it. And, and I think there's some biblical uh, support for this, specifically in the book of Job, mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, Job is, Job is met with, with intangible amounts of, of suffering. His, his family, his workers, they're, mm -hmm. all, they're all dying. His livestock is destroyed. Like his whole life goes, goes terribly wrong. And at one moment he does go to God and say, look, I mean, why... God, why are you allowing this to happen? And what does God say in response? Who is this that darkeneth counsel mm. with words without knowledge? Who is this that, that, wants to, that wants to come and ask me this explanation, having mm. absolutely no understanding of the way the universe works? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who were you? And this obviously takes quite, a, quite an authoritative tone. It's almost quite scary. You can imagine a voice like that out of the whirlwind being, being oh, quite yeah, off yeah, yeah, but yeah. If we take kind of, I guess, it doesn't strike me as the most wise, for instance. It, no, it might not be quiet. the most mm. loving, but then sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. Or and that would fall loving. into me not really knowing, you know, like why that path would be taken. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe maybe it's like if if God knows that you're not going to be able to understand the justifications he has. Mm -hmm. If you come to him and say, why is the suffering taking place? And he's like, ah, well, look, listen here, kid, man. Like, yeah, there are just certain things you won't understand. Maybe that's not going to, if he comes to you and says, you know, you, you can't be asking this and says it with a mm -hmm. bit more authoritative tone. It kind of puts you off the question in such a way as to say, well, this is obviously very important. You know, I, 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 OK, fair enough. God, maybe, maybe this just isn't something that I should be be, uh, be engaged in. But the, the point of that message that, that God gives to Job there, I think, can be potentially interpreted as, as saying, like, you could never hope to understand. Yeah. It, God doesn't say something like, yeah. what are you talking about? There's no justification. Why are you saying that I need a justification? No, he's, he's saying, saying yeah. why, do, why do you need to know what the justification is? And why do you expect to be able to understand it? Mm -hmm. You don't know about the universe. Mm -hmm. You don't, you, you darkeneth counsel. You, you weren't there when I laid the foundations of the earth. You don't have sufficient understanding. God isn't saying there is no justification or I don't need a justification. 
I think that he's potentially implying, well, look, I, yeah, I haven't have a, have an explanation, but how could you hope to understand it? And if that is the case, then maybe maybe I have no answer for you, for you, Steve. Maybe I don't know why all of these animals are allowed to suffer. But sounds a bit like faith. It is, yeah. yeah. But, it, but it doesn't have to be, because you could say, for instance, if you have separate arguments, mm -hmm. like the ontological argument, the cosmological arguments, these kind of things, mm -hmm. which establish mm -hmm. necessarily the existence yeah, yeah. of a perfectly moral being, then you know, by definition, because a, a maximally powerful benevolent being exists, that whatever he allows to happen must have sufficient moral warrant. Yes. Now, on its own, if I go to the problem of evil and I say, well, there is an explanation for the suffering, or mm -hmm. rather a justification for this suffering, but we'll never know what it is, then that seems a little lukewarm. It seems like, okay, like, well, then how could you possibly, what you're just, you're just saying, well, I, I don't have an answer for your objection, but I'm just going to assume that there is an explanation. Well, I'm not assuming that there's an explanation for the suffering. I'm deducing that from separate set of arguments that say that there exists a perfectly moral God, which means yeah. there must be an explanation for all evil. You, so you have an external reason to have your justification, justification in God, and then because of the God that you've justified, mm -hmm. you have a reason to be able to say, listen, we shouldn't actually have an answer necessarily. Necessarily. Yeah. What, it, what it means is that the, the separate arguments that a moral God exists mm. prove that where there is suffering and mm -hmm. apparent evil, mm. there is a justification for it. Yeah. That's a separate question as to whether we should know what that justification is. So I think that we can establish from separate arguments that whatever suffering exists has a justification. So when you say, why do all these animals suffer? There is a justification for that. I'm committed to that view as a Christian. Mm -hmm. But you want to, you, you seem to be asking kind of, well, why then? What, what is that justification? And what I'm saying is, I don't know, mm. but I wouldn't expect to know. I wouldn't expect to understand such a, such a complicated and, and, mystery that it that expands well, across billions of years okay let me throw you a a little a few a few objections right so if you have an all-powerful god then i think that god could could convince me of like why there is such gross suffering mm. and if you had an all-loving god then you already would have convinced me mm -hmm. now fair enough there may be some logical impossibilities going on there and so you know mm. but going back to that conceivability it seems perfectly conceivable to me that just as God can show me his existence through, say, the ontological argument or the Kalam or whatever it is, he he should be able to show me, uh, at least give me a grip on why this grotesque suffering exists. Sure. And like if you're if you're thinking of a being that doesn't do that, this is where my intuition is telling me, then I don't think you're thinking of the greatest possible being. Because I think the greatest possible being and this relates back to what we were saying on the ontological argument between can you actually conceive of the greatest possible mm. being? Because this epistemic barrier really falls into into the throw here. Yeah. So um, skeptical theism, at least the way I presented it, would commit me to the view that there's something impossible mm -hmm. or uh, something that contradicts something that God needs mm. in fully explaining to us why suffering exists. Mm -hmm. Because if God could explain the suffering to us mm -hmm. in a way that didn't upset other important projects, didn't upset human free will, uh, didn't uh, involve logical contradictions, didn't mm. involve explanations that no human being is capable of understanding by their yeah. metaphysical design, then he should provide that explanation. I agree with you. but Yeah, because just, just to really cross those T's, yeah. it sounds like when you're talking about the ontological argument, you want to say we can conceive of God, mm -hmm. and that's how we know he exists. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to talk about um, suffering, you want to basically say divine hiddenness. We can't actually conceive of God, and that's why we have this. And but basically, what I've seen from interacting with a lot of theists over the time is that they give you an answer over here in order to mm -hmm. deal with this, and they'll almost just forget that they. Like you said about William Lane Craig committing himself ontologically to things. Mm. They kind of forget about that when they come and deal with this over here. And I'm yeah. just like, I'm not sure they're compatible in that sense. One, one potential, I mean, you could you could maybe run a version of the ontological argument that again, mm. if if that's being run as like the first argument mm. in in the chain of thought then you could maybe kind of reject the moral element here. Mm -hmm. You could say that, like, the the maximally conceivable being isn't maximally moral or something like that. You'd use maybe a separate argument to say mm -hmm. that God is maximally moral um, or that God is perfectly moral. There might be something else that you can mm -hmm. use to justify that, in which case the inconceivability of, you know, perfect moral justification would, would be solved that way. Another mm -hmm. way might be to say that, like with the kind of, like we were discussing earlier about justice versus mercy and saying that, well, we might not know what the distinction is there, but we know that there is a correct answer and we just, 
when we conceive yeah. of a maximally great god, we're just saying that whatever the correct answer is, that god has it. We well, could well, say well, a similar well, thing here. Well, my point is that actually you know, mm. because your idea of what would be the right level isn't the same as mine. Mm -hmm. that's why I'm saying that it actually gets you into this polytheistic kind of position like I've met people that are hell bent on justice mm. and like mercy is 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 weakness and it's yeah. it's not right it's immoral in fact and I've met people that have basically said that justice can be immoral yeah so you have that mix but that's still just an epistemic mm. problem right someone's going to be wrong there if there <laughs> is an objective morality it, it's simply the case that someone is wrong yeah they're not they, they could be wrong on their morals they can't be wrong on whether or not something's justice or mercy no, but like the question at hand yeah. would be like, what is that balance? So if you want to say he's got maximum justice, which is a component of benevolence. Well, is it though? Like, is, yeah. is justice a component of benevolence or can these be separated? Uh, there, there is an interesting question here. If we're going to maximize all properties, does mm -hmm. that include maximizing like redness and blueness? Does that maximize, does that mean yeah, yeah. maximizing is, is your justice is your God maximizing red? mercy? Well, this is the, th I, I would say mm. Mine's no, turquoise. Because I would say like there are certain properties that you can ascribe to kind of abstract uh, Wait, so God's a thing that doesn't have colour, whereas every other thing has colour? Is that...? Uh, I guess everything that exists in reality uh, that's kind of big enough to be seen has colour. So God's not big enough to be seen? No, everything that exists in... in sorry, yeah, no, correct. Yeah, uh, yeah. When I say in reality there, I, I misspoke. I mean, anything that mm. exists kind of in the universe, within creation, is big enough to be that, seen. That's interesting, colour. yeah. Everything we know that exists is material. Yeah, so God's material. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay, cool. No, that's not that's not what I'm saying at all. Because yeah. I don't think material is a is, being material is a, is a great making property, as long as things can exist in but reality. But it's a thing without making. It's a thing property. Uh, yes, I suppose so. I mean, Jesus was material, so maybe maybe God does have a material aspect. I don't know. Yeah. Um, right, we're getting slightly off base, yeah. and it's my fault. So let's take this response to its conclusion. Mm. I'm going to basically apply a reductio. See how you respond. We've got a situation here, okay? Someone walks in the office and they just start stealing your stuff. Mm -hmm. Why would you try and prevent that? How do you not know that that's actually what God wants? That, why, is, why, why, that why, is a wonderful question. Yeah, why, 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 you know, why be upset about what's happening in Ukraine? Like, surely maybe that's for the best, you know, like as Voltaire said, all is for the best. Like, that earthquake hit in Lisbon, you mm. know, the centre of, of, of the church at that time and causing untold devastation, mm. um, they shouldn't have cleared up the debris, really, should they? In fact, clearing up the debris may have been an act of defiance because this position commits you to say, no, like, that's that's totally fine. So why are you not paralysed in that sense? I think that's a wonderful objection. Um, potentially the best objection to sceptical theism that exists, right? Mm -hmm. if, if we're going to say, as Christians, that, mm -hmm. sure, evil can exist and there might be a justification for it and you just aren't going to know that there's a justification. When things like, when someone comes in and steals you might say, well, well, how do you know that that's wrong? How do you know that it, that, that isn't one of the kind of evils that is like somehow beneficial or necessary or whatever? Mm. And so by trying to interfere with it, you know, you're, you're, you're doing something against God. To, to say that that's wrong, to say that you have good reason to interfere, is to say that you understand that there is no justification for that. But the sceptical theism wants, uh, theist wants to say that you won't know if there's justification for a moral act or not. Um, and sometimes you'll commit to the view that all evils do have justification. You just don't know what it is, so you should just let it be. Mm. There is an answer to this. Uh, I don't think you'll like it. No. And it's revelation. <laughs> Which is because I'm not just a sceptical yeah. theist, Steve. No, no, I'm a no. Christian sceptical theist. So that's another ontological price you've paid. But yes. fair enough, it gives you so more you, explanatory. You, you're going to want a separate... So, so, let's, so let's say, for instance, if, if I put the sceptical theism case mm. against a your objection to a loving God. Mm -hmm. And for now, we just have to say, well, yeah, I guess you would just have to let the person steal because you don't know. Mm. Right, there's a problem. Mm. How do we solve that? Well, then maybe mm. we'll move on to another argument. We'll talk about which God exists mm -hmm. and which scripture is true. Mm -hmm. And once we've done that and we put the whole thing together, we get a coherent worldview. Yeah. So if Christianity is true, we have divine revelation, which says that, for instance, thou shalt not steal. Okay. Now, And you're saying that's an act of stealing. So I think what's, what's happening here mm -hmm. is somebody... Uh, Whereas God yeah. can't provide an explanation for why certain evils exists, it exist, he can provide you the knowledge that certain things are such that he's okay with them and certain things are such that he's not. Mm -hmm. So because God never kind of talked about the suffering of animals in the wild and didn't you know, think it was important to try and prevent it or something like that, maybe that's one of the kinds of evils mm -hmm. that has an explanation that we just don't know about. Mm -hmm. Maybe thievery 
doesn't have a justification. Now, God still can't explain why that's justified or not justified. He's still, we're still not capable of understanding it, but because it is wrong... Because it's been revealed. Even, even if God can't explain why it's wrong, he'll at least want to let us know that it's wrong. So he'll tell us, don't steal. And we might say, well, well why? What's wrong with stealing? And he, and he might say, well, well, you're not going to be able to understand that. In the same way, you won't be able to understand why it's okay for evolution to kill billions of animals. Sure. But I'm telling you that the evolution thing is fine mm -hmm. and the stealing thing is not. The yes. explanation is a separate question. So yeah. if someone comes in here and tries to steal, mm -hmm. I can interfere and say you shouldn't do that because I know it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Not because I can justify why it's wrong from first principles, yeah. but because I can justify why God exists, why the Christian God is the right God, why mm -hmm. the Bible reveals his message. And that that commands people not to steal, and so he shouldn't be stealing. That that's yeah, yeah. that's, okay, okay, that's okay. the way I think you get around that. Problem. Yeah, revelation response. Okay, so what? Where does it say um, thou shall not have slaves? Thank you for watching, everybody. That's all we have time for. Um, <laughs> yet again. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I understood. The slavery question is an important one that I think can be responded to. I, I, not to dodge your question. I just wanted no, to say no, one no. more thing. You're going to buy some more ontology <laughs> over here and ignore that <laughs> yeah. it's not... Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, go I for it. I wanted to yeah. say uh, on the sceptical theism point, because you were saying uh, a maximally loving God would, would let me know why this suffering is taking place. At least my would, intuition if, if would say that if you, it would do a better job than what we actually but see. Let's say that if it were the case, for, for some reason, maybe because it somehow contradicts human free will, mm -hmm. maybe because human beings aren't... Oh, you believe in free will now? Yes. Okay. Maybe maybe yeah. human beings aren't metaphysically capable of understanding it. For whatever reason, God cannot explain mm -hmm. why your life seems to be abounded with suffering. It's like, well, okay, what could a loving God do in order to kind of try to get across that he is a loving God if he can't explain your suffering? Mm -hmm. Well... He can let you know that he loves you, mm. right? He can send down his son to suffer in order that you see that even if you can't understand why all the suffering is taking place, yeah. you know that God gets it. You know that he suffered too. It's not It's not like he's sitting but, above it all but and that's saying, a, that's the thing I don't get it. You, you're, all, you're all suffering mm. and I'm sitting above it saying, oh, this is fine. And mm. you're like, you know, what, what's going on here? You're not very loving. Yeah. God is coming down to earth, suffering with us in order to, to, to show us that, yes, I understand suffering is important and... I w I'm I'm suffering with you. I understand that this is a terrible thing, and he's so, demonstrating so it's just, that just he loves so I understand, you. you're saying an omnipotent being mm. is suffering. Yes. Okay. Because of course we need to. Because again, again, my intuition tells me I can now, now think of a stronger being than you. We'd need to get into a kind of. Well, wouldn't you say that a, a, an omnipotent being, a, a being that has no capability for suffering, mm -hmm. is not as great? No, no, as he has capability, has capability, but nothing can do it. I so he I, so he can conceive of it, but there's nothing that can make him suffer. Yeah, but that might be improved upon in the sense that having like an, Omega Chad having an experience of suffering, yeah. having gone through suffering, he's got that without having to experience it. Well, you can't have the. I think that's a contradiction. You can't have an experience of suffering without experiencing the suffering. You can have like an illusory one. You could like implant a false memory, but you can't actually have the experience of the suffering without suffering. So you think God couldn't do that? Because if you're going to go for like you don't understand God, it sounds like you actually do understand these things now. And, and now you're committing yourself to a position where you do really understand these things. And so yeah. with these questions, you can give me straight answers. But I, with this one, you, <laughs> it's just I think hands the, are I up. think the only thing that yeah, you yeah. can say about God with certainty is that logical contradictions are impossible for him. For him. And about yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, for, for any, they're just impossible. But, but what if he just wants you to think that? Like, it's Because it's, it's actually, no, they can happen. It's just... You're a feeble mortal being, and and for the same reason he hides, say mm. the suffering. He's also going to hide, um, hide that fact. If we're going to throw out logical consistency or mm. this kind of stuff, like yeah, you're you're right. You could potentially do that. Um, mm -hmm. Descartes considers the question of what if God makes all mm -hmm. the evil. I uh, know. Oh, I think he does attribute it to God. Why doesn't God make him go wrong every time he adds mm. two and two mm. um, to get four? Maybe it's actually five, and he just goes wrong every time. Descartes' response was that would make God a deceiver. Um, but you could also say that, like, maybe, OK, that that's fair and that might undermine a lot of the, the arguments I'm putting forward. But it also undermines this very conversation. Like we should just we should just pack up and go home because everything we're saying is reliant upon logical rules that we're both ascribing to. Mm -hmm. And if they're potentially false, then then why are we bothering in the first place? You know? but, but the thing is, is that I've got reasons to believe in, say, the law of non-contradiction. But your reason to believe in it is nested in God. And you've just no. said that God can do these things. I don't think sorry, it's sorry, nested in God. Uh, sorry, your your, my view as a naturalist of the law of non-contradiction is going to be straight, whereas yours is going to go through the prism mm. of God. Mm -hmm. As it goes through the prism of God, you have all of these epistemic questions coming up about how he could rephrase this in certain ways to be able to come across for you. It seems like it's a unique problem for you it's, and not for me. It's possible that... It, it, 
I'm, there's a lot of confusing language going on here. Mm. It's it possible. It's possible that maybe God can't do that. And it's not a problem to say that there are things God can't do. Yeah. Like God, God can't do, God can't perform logical contradictions is, is usually mm. um, uh, a kind of uh, a line that some theists take. Uh, others will say that um, I'm indebted to my to my friend Maximally Great Philosophy, the YouTube channel, which I'll also link in the Excellent. description. Well, I'll do it if he actually manages to make another video anytime soon after me having so generously gifted him some viewers and subscribers, and then he repaid them by not making any more content. Um, <laughs> but having spoken to him, he's of the opinion that... Maybe, maybe that's for the best, by the way. Maybe, maybe that is like for the best. Maybe that's what God wants. Maximally great philosophy from him is just to keep quiet. It's just to keep quiet. It's just it's just to keep quiet and smile and like that's that's what it is. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is what you get, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. You, like you, you should. You, don't know you probably shouldn't make that judgment, mate, because maybe like not. you don't know what we God doesn't. Yeah. yeah, that's right. There could because be. there isn't there isn't like a don't have slaves, don't murder. Maximally great philosophy won't publish. I, like, I think that even yeah. if we can't understand it, there is very good justification as to why. Mm. Uh, Ryan shouldn't make any more videos. Actually, I think I can understand why right. he wouldn't make any more videos. There's very La good reason for that. <laughs> last tie in the bow. Yeah, I take speaking as a we? friend, by the way. La where, where just, just last tie in the bow for this, right? Mm -hmm. You were just saying that it could be possible for God to do X, right? Oh, so uh, yeah. What I was saying, but but, was... but, but what, the whole thing here is just like off the table for me because you're talking about what's possible for God. And yet when it comes to the animal suffering, you want to say that you don't know what's possible. Okay, for God. what I was trying to do is make a distinction between mm -hmm. saying if 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 there are things that mm. aren't logically impossible, then yeah, we don't know if God can do them or not. Mm. We, we don't know if God is doing them. We don't know if he has justification. But if something's logically contradictory, then we know that God can't do it. You said, well, how do you know that you have the right perception of what's logically true, possible? Yeah. And I, I would say that, so the response that Ryan has given me when we've spoken about logic is he said that logical contradictions just aren't things. It, it's not like they're, they're kind of, they're things that God can't do. Why does he believe they're that? They're just not things because they have no reference. They, they like even conceptually, like a square circle. But why does he believe that? Why does he believe that? Um, why, do you, well, why, guess, why, why do you believe I that? See, I see what you're getting at, but I think, I mean, well, you'd have to ask him why he believes that. Sure. Um, I, 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 I see what you're driving at, which is like maybe the reason why you think that's the case. I, We're going through the prism of God. I think it's just like because if like... If that's like a window where all our knowledge it, has to pass through, for, it's... Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, maybe that because we've actually kind of had this discussion before about whether we can reject the laws of logic, and we basically had this argument. Have I except... convinced you of Islam yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, not not quite. Okay, that's, all right. That's, all right. that's okay, next. Okay, uh, okay, April 1st. okay. All right, all right. Um, uh, I think. Okay. I've got to wrap this one up. I, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. Let's not get lost on the weeds here. I think that if we're willing to grant that we can accept that God can't do the logically impossible, which is what you're quarrelling with. Um, and again, this is a good place, I think, to put a pin in this argument because this would be the point of contention. I think if if we can confidently say God can't do logical contradictions, um, then I can say that whereas there might be an explanation for uh, there might be an explanation for all of the suffering in the animal kingdom, and we just we just can't know it. That doesn't mean I can't know anything about God because I can know that God can't do logical contradictions. So anytime you try to ascribe something to him that would be logically contradictory, mm -hmm. I can say, no, no, that, that can't be true of God. Mm -hmm. And you might say, oh, so now you can conceive of what God can and can't do yeah. only when we're talking about logical possibility. Okay. Um, whereas if God, if we can't know with certainty that God uh, has mm -hmm. to also preclude logical mm -hmm. impossibility, then you're quite right. But then I think if we, if we do that... Um, Although you're right that your conception of logical consistency doesn't run through God, the prism of God, mm -hmm. you'd still have to respond to an objection as to how you know the laws of logic are true. And, but but rather than topic. opening up that discussion, we've actually had that discussion mm -hmm. a few years ago in a rather nice garden. Uh, <laughs> yes, we did. In, uh, objectively good. Yeah. In, objectively maximally in, great in like, in like 2017, 2018 or something like that. I'll yeah. leave a link to that. In you were about half your age as well, then, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And an atheist. Back when I used to be an atheist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's, uh, I'll leave that in the description down below because mm. we talked about logical possibility. And Did. from an atheistic perspective, I was arguing that the laws of logic, we must accept them as true. You were arguing that we could potentially deny them. So that's the same Ideas, conversation yeah, we're yeah, having yeah, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which we've already had. So we, we can we can have it there. Yeah. Um, we, we've only actually, I mean, I, I actually think that's that's maybe a good place to wrap up only because mm. of the time constraint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would have been nice to maybe talk to you about the Kalam, mm -hmm. contingency, the yeah. moral argument, more on the problem of evil, divine hiddenness, but yep. we could go on for hours and hours. So maybe next uh, April 1st we can 
we can revisit the, the I, situation. I, I, I think that would be absolutely <laughs> marvelous. But as I told you, I'm probably going to be pagan by then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That would be that would be even more interesting. Though. Very interesting. I yeah. think that's been a that's been good though because we've done the most important argument for God's existence, the ontological, which shows that God exists as a tautology. Yes. To true, say yeah. God doesn't exist is to say a being that necessarily exists doesn't exist, which is yeah. a contradiction. So you know, come on, yeah, get yeah. with it. Imagine believing Spider Man with man in the definition doesn't exist. Like that was. Imagine thinking yeah. that Sherlock Holmes isn't a man. Uh, well, yeah, I mean... Nobody, yeah, please, yeah, nobody yeah, click yeah, that, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take that out of context. You know what I meant by that. You know full well what I meant by that. Yeah. Um, look, yes. So I think we should we should, we should should wrap it up here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this has been a good conversation. No, d- definitely, yeah. It's been, it's been great. I think uh, it, what, we've, what we've essentially done is, is shown much like... And this is what I liked so much about the conversation I had with... Craig, who I'll mention again for a what, fourth time now. He's you, just, you just got a flex, you. you know. He's just like a sugar daddy. Um, he, he basically, that conversation, what I liked so much is that I think his position is perfectly consistent, at mm. least on the service level, as deep as we went, he, everything he said was perfectly consistent. I also think everything I said was consistent. We yeah. talked about mereological nihilism and yeah. stuff. And Craig said to me, well, yeah, like, you can believe that if you want, but just be aware of what it commits you to. Yeah. So yeah, you can reject the ontological argument in the way that we've, in the way that you've done it, but yeah. it might commit you to the view that Sherlock Holmes isn't a man or that his front door isn't black. Yeah. Um, I can, you know, accept the sceptical theism as a way to get around the problem of evil, but maybe that commits me to views about, like, um, not being able to ascribe certain moral properties to God, or at least... Well, I, I would actually say it commits you to epistemic uh, collapse. Mm. I think that just every, when you get that, when you take that position, all of your arguments, because yeah. it's all relying on logic and reason and rationality, I, I, I think it completely rebuts. That, that of course, is a more serious objection, but I guess it it'll is. be up to the audience to decide whether they think that that fits. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. if they want to hear this conversation re- revisited, because if, yeah, if yeah. we get a lot of questions and stuff of people really wanting us to continue mm. it, maybe we can just revisit it in future. Absolutely. Um, but I guess apart from that, I don't know if there's anything else you want to want to say or add in, in, in wrapping up. I just want to say good luck with with the campaign yeah um just really sell god mm. like really really big him up because you know you compete with some fierce religions out there they think like their gods are better but your, yours is better yours is the maximum great, great. Max, yeah. max, max, max great so yeah um and then just just really i guess the final thing i would say is going back to what you're saying about craig where you went look my view is consistent craig is consistent yeah but you're going to hell well, you was, mm. but you're not anymore. Yeah, I or was, you're going to be although, annihilated. You know, you know, Steve. Yeah. To be honest with you, mate, yeah. like we've had the discussion today, and yeah. I've got to say, you've talked me out of it. Oh, fair enough. Oh, okay, all right. I'm going yeah, yeah. to ta- take this down. Is it down? Yeah. All right. And okay. um, when I play yeah, the yeah. intro, yeah. Uh, sorry, when I play the outro to this yeah. podcast, I'm going to revert it to the Cosmic Skeptic podcast. So if you're a little all confused right. as to why this came up under the Cosmic Skeptic podcast, it's because, look, when this podcast began, I thought, you know, Cosmic Christianity will do the trick. But, yeah. Steve, you talked me out of it. Congratulations. Hey, it's so good. So We're back good. to Cosmic Skeptic. Yeah, good, it means yeah. I don't have to rebrand. It yeah, means I don't yeah, have to yeah. be a graphic designer as well. Yeah, Cosmic Skeptic, skeptic means you're a global skeptic. So Yeah, yeah exactly. Co- stuff, yeah. Cos- that's one reason why William Lane Craig nearly... That's what six times I've mentioned him now. Yeah, yeah. He nearly didn't come on the podcast yeah, because yeah. I was called cosmic skeptic, and he thought that I was this like, <laughs> like you know, Tyronean skeptic, and he thought we'd get nowhere. It was only when like he yeah, was, he was like, told that I wasn't that. That <laughs> that's like saying I'm not going to really have a conversation with him because his website's called Reasonable Faith, and that's nonsense. Like, yeah, well, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I think I think if, <laughs> yeah, he, if, yeah. if my name did actually indicate that I was a skeptic mm. of everything of the universe like mm. fair enough i can see why he wouldn't think you'd no, get very get far it. i didn't know this until he did a podcast episode talking about our conversation and That's he mentioned great. that at the beginning and yeah. i didn't realize how close i'd come um but yeah i'm glad to be back in the cosmic skeptic skin it feels good. a bit more yeah. more comfortable thank you for you're gonna go back to, to all that sex and parties yeah yeah, 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 yeah good yeah, good yeah, yeah, that, great, that great. was quite a strong that was too, a strong yeah. argument um, yeah yeah <laughs> okay well on this wonderful april 1st i mean wouldn't it be magical if somebody watched this kind of you know, 11 p.m. on April 1st, and now that I'm back to Cosmic Skeptic, just by coincidence, yeah. it's now April 2nd. How does that happen? What can we say? Really, really strange. Yeah, isn't like, it? well, God works in mysterious ways. And if you think there's an issue, well, there's not, it's just God intends for you to, he can't really explain it. You're, yeah. you're a small being and he can't really explain it properly. Yeah, He's just, well, I try to say when, when, a, when a Christian puts an objection to me that I can't respond to, like, God, yeah. God works in mysterious ways, and so do I. Yeah. Um, with that said, Thank you all for watching. Please do if you like the content, and I promise that it's going to be back to a sceptical uh, atheism. He, mean, he means veganism. 
<laughs> if you like veganism too, uh, then please do consider supporting the podcast and the channel on patreon.com forward slash cosmic skeptic. Uh, do consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. It helps keep the channel afloat and also gives you access, early access to videos, uh, as well as the ability to vote on video topics, as well as every now and again, I do a private live stream, Q and A's, that kind of stuff. So if you really like the content, please do consider it. Steve's channel hey. is Rationality Rules. Yep. And thank you again for coming on. I'll leave a link in the description again. Yep. And he also has a Patreon, which you can support as well, if you like. Oh, we yeah. can do one of these as well, if you want. I'll, oh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just know that I'm going to rebrand to Pagan Rules yeah. next year. <laughs> um, and I hope that you're not going to show them this video before April 1st. You said that you're going to give them the, you know, prior content. You don't want that. That's... Can, you, can, you imagine, <laughs> can you imagine the confusion if I like accidentally... If I upload this, but like in a different yeah, yeah, time yeah, yeah. zone, it's yeah, like yeah. not even April 1st. They're just yeah. like, what on earth? you got Australians this? going. Yeah, going, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who, uh, like yeah. Ken Ham would have a field day, right? Yeah, he will. <laughs> um, but with that said... Thank you all for watching. I really do appreciate you taking the time to spend an hour and a half with us. Um, go and watch the sister video that we're making on Steve's channel, which won't be uh, me as Cosmic Christian. Now that I'm Cosmic Skeptic again, we'll be, we'll be talking, uh, we'll be having a conversation uh, as Cosmic Skeptic and Rationality Rules on Steve's channel. Link in the description as well, whenever it comes out. Um, but with that said, as always, I've been your host, Alex O'Connor. Today's guest has been Stephen Woodford of the YouTube channel Rationality Rules. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Follow us on various social medias. Support us on Patreon. Gosh, that's a lot of sentences. I said wrap up, didn't I? It's like... Get this out, dude. I, Let them leave. I'm still Let not even leave. there. They've probably already left yeah, already. I mean, for the, for the like two people who are still yeah. left over, thanks. And I'll see you in the next one. And another thing. <laughs> <laughs>